We are a justice-making, truth-seeking people. We gather as a community of believers and seekers. We share a reverence for the mystery of life. We are building the beloved community. Come, let us worship together. Justice, Meaning, and Purpose by David Breeden. We light this chalice remembering and honoring our own tradition and celebrating the rich diversity of traditions among us. As we search for justice, meaning, and purpose, may we remember that justice, meaning, and purpose live first in deeply listening to one another. Our first hymn this morning is 131.
everyone. This morning's story is called The Difference Between Heaven and Hell, which is a story that has become popular among cultures all around the world. It has Jewish, South Asian, and European tellings, among others. Today's telling was adapted by Eliza Pierman from a Japanese and Chinese folktale. Long ago, there lived an old woman who had a wish. She wished more than anything to see for herself the difference between heaven and hell. The monks at the temple agreed to grant her request. They put a blindfold around her eyes and said, first, you shall see hell. When the blindfold was removed, the old woman was standing at the entrance of a great dining hall. The hall was full of round tables, each piled high with the most delicious foods, meats, vegetables, fruits, breads, and desserts of all kinds. The smells that reached her nose were wonderful. The old woman noticed that in hell, there were people seated around these tables. She saw that their bodies were thin and their faces were gaunt and creased with frustration. Each person held a spoon. The spoons must have been three feet long. They were so long that the people in hell could reach the food on those platters, but they could not get the food back to their mouths. As the old woman watched, she heard their hungry, desperate cries. I've seen enough, she cried. Please let me see heaven. And so again, the blindfold was put around her eyes and the old woman heard, now you shall see heaven. When the blindfold was removed, the old woman was confused. For there she stood again at the entrance to a great dining hall filled with round tables piled high with the same lavish feast. And again, she saw that there were people sitting just out of arm's reach with the food with those three foot long spoons. But as the old woman looked closer, she noticed that the people in heaven were plump and had rosy, happy faces. As she watched, a joyous sound of laughter filled the air. And soon the old woman was laughing too, for now she understood the difference between heaven and hell for herself. The people in heaven were using those long spoons to feed each other. The mission of Birmingham Unitarian Church is to be a free and welcoming religious community that encourages the lives of integrity, learning, service, and joy. One way we live out this mission is by giving half of our weekly offering to a nonprofit organization that shares our values and addresses needs in one of these areas. Environmental action, economic justice, civic engagement, and racial justice. We support a new organization each month. Our recipient for February is Michigan Liberation, whose mission is to end the criminalization of black families and communities of color. They train and develop formerly incarcerated people and their loved ones to lead in advocating for the transformation of the criminal legal system. One of their current projects is to grow support for legislative bills to reform our state's cash bail system. Your offering can be given via cash or checks by mail, by using Venmo, or through our website. Let there be an offering in support of our beloved community and organizations that build the world we dream about.
We are a church of open minds, loving hearts, and helping hands. With gratitude, we dedicate this offering to the good works of our congregation and dedicate ourselves to its service. We have come to the time in our, our service we set aside for prayer, reflection, and meditation. First, we have a, a joy and sorrow from Larry Larson. At the Olympics, the world comes together to celebrate human achievements, but sadly, many human rights are violated in China, where the Olympics are being held. A joy. Although 2023 seems quite a way off, the Campbell Fox family is excited that eldest son Galen and his fiance, Samantha Gavlis, have set a date for their wedding, which was long postponed by the pandemic. Each Sunday, we celebrate the highs and lows of our lives. For those joys and sorrows, shared or unshared, know that we hold you in our hearts. And now, going deeper, crossing borders from Stephenship. Spirit of my longing and lonely heart, help me travel through the barren borderlands that separate me from others. Teach me to willingly explore relationships with those who frighten or threaten me. Grant me the courage to risk confidently my own comforts that I might make others more comfortable. And when I am burdened by the isolating choices I have made, grant me the wisdom to invite a stranger to travel with me. As we travel, Grant me the vision to notice how each step we take together moves us closer to the promised land where all souls grow in hope and resilience. Now, let us enter a moment of silence together. Sing with me. for me. 
Borders and boundaries are part of what shapes us. When I was 12 or 13, my mom had a textbook for a class she was taking at Wayne State. It was huge, hard to miss wherever she left it, and had terrific maps of Detroit's ethnic, race, class, and religious makeup. Someone did a lot of work. My brother and I studied these maps with a zeal that was quite remarkable. That textbook illustrated for us something we already knew through our own experience. We were aware of the diversity of Detroit's neighborhoods and whether they were black or white, Catholic or Jewish, Polish or Italian, rich or poor. We knew where the Catholic churches were where the synagogues were, where Detroit's Unitarian Church was. My devoutly atheist family always called it the Unitarian Church. Not only did we identify neighborhoods, but we could identify the borders that divided them. We lived on a street dividing a public housing project from single family homes. Our neighborhood bordered the all-white city of Dearborn. Every week, at least once, we left our west side working class Catholic neighborhood to trek across the city to the Jewish neighborhood for anything from doctors to shoes to visits to grandma. As we, my brother and I got older, and I got a driver's license, we traversed the city even more. We drove friends home after parties and folk dancing. We would go for ice cream at midnight at the Howard Johnson's on Woodward in Highland Park, or to dinner at the Golden Fleece in Greektown. We were never lost, and there were few neighborhoods, especially on the west side, that we didn't know fairly well. We were familiar with Wayne State, Highland Park, Greektown, and the area around the University of Detroit. We even crossed what seems to be one of Detroit's biggest boundaries, that which divided east from west. To us, the east side was practically a foreign country. We knew Windsor, which is in a foreign country, <laughs> about, about as well as we knew the east side. Sometimes I envied kids who had more culturally homogeneous childhoods, the kids who knew they belonged to the Italian community or who grew up in the Greek Orthodox Church. On one side of my family, I had cousins who grew up on a farm and attended a one-room schoolhouse in rural Michigan. On the other side of my family, I had cousins who were preparing for their bar mitzvah. I didn't belong in either camp. Sometimes I wish I did, but mostly I think I would have chafed at it. On the whole, it was good to have an understanding of the richness of the city in which I grew up. It wasn't the borders and boundaries that shaped me. It was the crossing of those boundaries that did. I wish now that I had crossed more boundaries with less fear than I did. Discovering a diverse city opened my mind Sometimes it opened my mind very slowly. Sometimes someone had to give me a shove. Curiosity about, at, curiosity about and interest in the multiplicity of people was, I think, one of the many things that helped me find my way to this Unitarian Church.
The fifth UU principle offers us the right to conscience, the responsibility to make decisions based on what we believe is right. This cannot stand on its own and luckily it doesn't have to. A decision that counters the other seven principles cannot be claimed as one guided by the fifth. But like all covenants, the UU principles are aspirational. None of us lives every principle all of the time and this does not make us bad people, simply makes us human and invites us to try again. This process of trying and failing is unavoidable, but it is not without consequences. And since covenants are re relational, sometimes the consequence of not living out every principle all of the time is that someone gets hurt. We have all experienced being hurt before, whether it is an unkind word, systemic oppression, grief. We are all familiar with the emotional hurt on some level. Where in your body do you carry your hurt? When you experience something hurtful, what does that feel like? For me, it is a tightness in my chest and throat and I often cry, which brings that sensation up into my head. It's not a fun feeling. Sometimes I wish I had a shield made out of love and resiliency that I could 
lift up for protection whatever harm is on its way. I wish actually that harm would never come my way, but try as we might to all the ethical, good human beings, it is a fact of life that mistakes happen. Which means we have all been on the other side of that scenario too. We've all hurt someone else. Sometimes it is intentional in the angry words of an argument, but most often I believe we, the harm we cause is accidental. When you realize that you've hurt someone, what does that feel like in your body? For me, it's a sinking feeling in my stomach, catching of my breath. I call it shame, and it's one of my least favorite feelings. Shame tells me to hide. It makes me want to run away from the harm I've caused. For this, I wish I had a different kind of shield, one made of irrelevant reassurances that I am in fact still a good person, stuck together with a healthy dose of denial. This I would crouch behind until the wronged party gives up on finding me or until enough time has passed that it would be awkward for them to bring it up. I know that other people have this same kind of shield because I've witnessed nearly everyone I know crouch behind it at one time or another. I have lost friendships to this shield because either I or the other person refused to come out and address the problem. But does this shield make sense? If I said or did something that hurt someone else and whip out a shield to protect me, what exactly am I protecting myself from? Well, it's not protection, but I am preventing feedback from reaching me. I am denying the other person the ability to express to me the ways my behavior or actions negatively impacted them. I am choosing my own comfort over another person's safety. This, of course, is bad for my relationship with that other person. It also sends a troubling message to others who might share that person's identity or experiences. It shows newcomers the kind of behavior that is acceptable in our community. And refusing to hear my effect on those around me does not challenge me to grow. Perhaps cowering behind a shield feels safer to one individual, but it is at the direct expense of the entire community. Here's an example. My pronouns are they, them. And as a trans person, I experience this strange and painful phenomenon where other people regularly forget or ignore my pronouns. And while most people respond to my corrections with grace, others pull out their shield and hide behind grammar, good intentions, or a misunderstanding of gender identity and expression. The first and the last of these are solvable with some education if the person is open to it. The second though, good intentions, attempts to shield the person from acknowledging their mistake and changing their behavior by pretending the conversation is not about pronouns and harm at all, but rather a moral judgment on them. As if my pronouns are actually they them is a personal attack on their character rather than a reminder of our shared covenant to call people what they want to be called. It is the sphere of judgment of being seen as a bad person that drives us to lift up that shield that denies that someone else was hurt at all. The right to conscience implies that when faced with a decision, do I respect this person's pronouns or not? We might have to spend a little time being uncomfortable or practicing learning how to say a new pronoun because our conscience paired with our UU values will not allow us to do anything less. We have to figure out how to do accountability. Accountability is that thing that happens after harm is caused. It's a messy, difficult process where the one who caused harm must get over their shame, come out from behind that shield and address the impact of their actions. Let's take another moment. It is likely that you have experienced being held accountable before, whether by a parent or a teacher, perhaps 
someone corrected you on their pronouns or informed you that they don't like it when you treat them a certain way? What does it feel like in your body when you're being held accountable? Uh, not the aftermath or the emotionally regulated recognition that the other person is in the right. What does it feel like in your body while you're in the middle of the mess that is accountability? I carry my reaction to accountability in my shoulders and in all the blood that rushes to my face. I do often cry because even if I recognize that the other person is right, the embarrassment and discomfort is really difficult to deal with. That discomfort, that ugh, of getting back into covenant with others feels like a valid reason to hide behind a shield. But once we hold that impulse up against our UU values, we begin to understand that while the feeling itself is valid, the action, the response of hiding is not. There is nothing wrong with wanting to feel safe. A community that does not feel safe is a troubled community. But am I actually feeling unsafe because my inherent worth and dignity is being questioned? Or am I simply uncomfortable because someone is pointing to my actions and asking me to apologize or change? Our right to conscience cannot exist separately from the other principles. A choice that protects me individually while denying the safety and belonging of others is not a choice that the fifth principle calls Unitarian Universalists to. I can sit here and say, for all these reasons, put down that denial shield and reasonably expect that not a single shield will drop, mine included. Because we can rationally separate the impact of harm from the discomfort of accountability and see how they're different. But hurt and shame don't live in the realm of the rational. They are embodied. So our quest to convince ourselves and our beloved community members to drop the shields needs to address the body's sense of safety. When I realize I have hurt someone else, I feel a sinking in my stomach as shame takes hold. If my impulse is to run and hide, what I need in order to avoid lifting my denial shield is courage. I need to find the strength to face discomfort and accountability. Well, very few of us have an unlimited supply of courage in our back pockets, but most of us have a shoulder we can offer to cry on. We can dig deep for some words of encouragement. We can offer the kinds of supports that will allow someone to find their courage. And we can trust that when it is our turn in the hot seat, others will come forward with similar supports. Accountability is by definition a collaborative process. And while the person who caused harm is not the driver of that bus, they're not alone either. Naming a harm requires vulnerability and courage. Accepting accountability for causing harm requires vulnerability and courage too. Accountability assumes that relationship is important and that sometimes in order to deepen relationship, we have to make a change or take an action that is just, even if it's not entirely fun. This morning's time for all ages brought us one concept of heaven and hell in which the difference between the two is that the people in heaven care about one another. And it's not just a hypothetical sense of caring, it influences their actions. The people in heaven care enough about each other to feed one another. Likewise, universalist theology asks us as living, breathing, loving humans to take part in building heaven on earth. Heaven, justice, beloved community, whether your expression of Unitarian Universalism uses words like heaven or not, this is the theology we come from. It is part of who we are, and even after several generations and multiple transformations, the call to social justice remains central to our faith. Our tradition and theology call us to care about one another so much that we begin to feed each other. 
rather than shields, we Unitarian Universalists must figure out more of a magical circle of protection within which we collectively have the right to safety. No shields necessary. The right to safety cannot be a hypothetical lofty ideal. It must be the work of our very lives to create beloved community, to change the way we are with one another so that we might all experience heaven on earth because I cannot name it heaven right now. I confess I don't know what heaven on earth would be like. In the world as it is today, peace and justice are hard to find even in small doses. But there are a few things I think are pointed kind of in the right direction. I'll imagine this magic circle of protection as a sort of shining thread that serves as a threshold into Unitarian Universalism. The thread is made up of eight principles, wisdom from six sources, and the values that those guiding pieces of our faith lead to. Crossing that threshold means I agree to do my best to live up to those goals and to be responsible to others inside the circle by supporting them in their efforts and leaning on them when I falter in mine. This threshold is always ready to be crossed over by new people. The circle is always able to widen, but the values that make up the magic circle are strong. When it happens that hateful words or oppressive systems, entrenched bigotry come knocking, the circle does not break. This circle may be imaginary, but the values that make it up are real, as are the people who live out those values. We build the circle of protection every time we welcome newcomers into Unitarian Universalism by telling them our story. When we bring Unitarian Universalism back out into the world through social action. When we find the courage to put down our individual shields and trust each other, trust our principles to help us make loving choices and face accountability when we miss the mark. Within this circle, which is always ready to be drawn wider, a pronoun correction is met with gratitude and the hard work to change. When faced with a difficult decision or interpersonal conflict, the circle of values holds us close and guides us as we try to work it out. In that circle, we trust each other to make decisions that may not be the one I individually want to make, but that I recognize is the decision that will bring me and everyone inside the circle closer to our highest ideals. This is the imaginary beloved community that inspires me. The shining potential of what UU values could be for us is why I am Unitarian Universalist. I believe so strongly that we can learn how to throw away those useless denial shields that get in the way of true reconciliation and transformative connection. I believe that we can have heaven on earth and I even dare to hope against all reason that I'll get to catch a glimpse of it in my lifetime. May it be so. Blessed be. Please join in singing Answering the Call of Love. <laughs>
Go now into this world as a beacon of hope and joy. Go in love, go in peace. Now that our, our worship has ended, our service begins. May it be so. Amen. Blessed be.